So once again, um, it's my pleasure to welcome one and all to the fourth lecture in the SOAS World Philosophies Lecture Series. Uh, the lecture series is organized uh, by the World Philosophies team here at SOAS. Uh, and it is, of course, in, in line with our uh, understanding of philosophy. Um, in the World Philosophies program here, uh, philosophy is approached, uh, taught, and researched uh, as a robust human activity with diverse and rich history emerging from uh, different traditions of the world. And so these lectures are meant to revisit issues surrounding the suppressing and marginalization of this robust history and how the discipline can be applied, enriched, and decolonized. And this makes our lecture today very timely. Um, these lectures will also be exploring specific themes and issues in specific traditions of philosophy over time. So before the lecture begins, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Andrew Hines, who is a key member of the philosophy team here. Um, I do not think our uh, uh, subject head has connected yet. Um, Andrew, did, is John here? I don't, I don't think so. Um, I do uh, not see her at the moment. The subject head for the World Philosophies Program is Dr. Sean Hawthorne, uh, who might join us a bit later. And now to, to our guest, uh, lecturer today, Professor Peter Park. Uh, uh, Peter K.J. Park is Associate Professor Emeritus at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, he received a PhD in history from the University of California in Los Angeles. And he is one of the co-editor of Sanskrit and Orientalism, Indology and Comparative Linguistics in Germany. And his other book, which I consider very important, particularly for the World Philosophies Program, is um, titled Africa, Asia, and the History of Philosophy, Racism in the Formation of the Philosophical Canon, 1780 to 1830. Uh, this book uh, was selected as a France Fanon outstanding book by the Caribbean Philosophical Society. Uh, Park is also uh, very proud of being the first ever to propose uh, the creation of ethnic studies curriculum for the University of Texas at Dallas, which he drafted in 2018. Uh, since becoming emeritus in 2019, he has been a visiting scholar uh, in the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University. Uh, I was keen on getting Peter to speak in this series because his book, um, Africa, Asia, and the History of Philosophy, which we mentioned earlier, has been part of our core reading for some of our modules, uh, such as the module debates, methods, and themes in world philosophies. Um, so it, it, it is such a fascinating book, and we are therefore very pleased to have him with us today uh, to speak on some of these issues. Uh, Peter will be speaking on the theme, uh, Enlightenment, Raciology, and the revision of the history of philosophy. Um, we really look forward to your talk, Peter. And as Andrew said earlier, if you could please remain muted. Um, after the talk, we'll have opportunity to make our comments and ask questions, and then you can use the reason future and, and um, then unmute yourself, or then use, or we can simply use the chat feature as well. So, um, uh, Peter, we warmly welcome you to the lecture, and uh, you have our attention. Thank you. Um, thank you to the Department of Philosophy and Religion at SOAS uh, for this prestigious invitation. Um, I'm part of a lecture series that uh, follows a talk given by Hamid Dabashi, uh, who I uh, admire highly. And also you will have uh, other speakers whose work I follow uh, keenly. Um, I would like to uh, congratulate the Department of Philosophy and Religion uh, for holding this lecture series uh, during and through a pandemic time. 
I think that already in Elvis's introduction of the lecture series, uh, the problem at hand uh, was already articulated. The problem of Eurocentrism in the teaching and conception of philosophy, exclusion, marginalization, understanding the causes for or the reasons of such marginalization and how scholars today can address the problem. What I would like to do is I would like to begin my PowerPoint and uh, briefly uh, use uh, a very distinct voice uh, from the last century, early part of the last century, to articulate again the problem that Elvis alluded to. Let me share my screen. Yeah, we'll see just, it now. Yeah. We'll Wonderful, thank you. There it is. So I would like to use the voice of W.E.B. Du Bois from one of his autobiographical writings from 1910. How easy then by emphasis and omission to make children believe that every great soul the world ever saw was a white man's soul, that every great thought the world ever knew was a white man's thought, that every great deed the world ever did was a white man's deed, that every great dream the world ever sang was a white man's dream. And from his essay of the culture of white folk. And in this essay, he is addressing uh, white supremacism uh, in the US context, and also delivering commentary on uh, Europe's World War I, Europe has never produced and never will in our day a single human soul that cannot be matched and overmatched in every line of human endeavor by Asia and Africa. Run the gamut, if you will, and let us have the Europeans who in sober truth overmatch Black Nefertiti, Mohammed, Ramses, and Askia, Confucius, Buddha, and Jesus Christ. If we could scan the calendar of thousands of lesser men in like comparison, the result would be the same. But we cannot do this because of the, deliberate, the deliberately educated ignorance of white schools by which they remember Napoleon and forget Sony Ali. So Du Bois, uh, as my PowerPoint is loading up, Du Bois, is connecting Eurocentered, white centered education with modern colonialism and also connecting it to imperial, uh, imperial war, such as World War I. I'm waiting for the PowerPoint. Okay. And
and sees Eurocentered knowledge as a part of a colonialism and uh, race-based economic and imperialist exploitation. So what he's alluding to is, for example, philosophy's own account of what it is through its history, its account of its origins. Um, what I do in my book, and also to set up the, the question, is to survey histories of philosophy ranging from the last 200 plus years. In Julius Bergman's History of Philosophy from 1892, he writes, just as its name, so philosophy itself is originally Greek. There is the history of philosophy by Friedrich Michaelis, 1865, and the opinion that no Asian people has lifted itself to the heights of free human contemplation from which philosophy issues. Philosophy is a fruit of the Hellenic spirit. Albert Schwegler's German History of Philosophy in, in Outline, 1863. The question, when and where does philosophy begin? Obviously, at the point when the first search for the final philosophical principle for the ultimate reason for building, for being, was made in a philosophical manner. In other words, with Greek philosophy. Edward Seller. A Neo-Kantian from the late 19th century. In his history of, of Greek philosophy, on the question of philosophy's origins, all the sea, he writes, all the same, we do not need to search for any foreign sources. The philosophical science of the Greeks may be completely explained by recalling the spirit the devices and the educational status of the Hellenic tribes. If there were ever been a people which, has suited, which was suited to generate its sciences on its own, it was the Greek. Similar opinions in numerous other works by historians of philosophy. I'll pass over some of these, including the one by George Henry Lewis. Oh, this one is written in English from 1781, as well as Guy Martin's A History of Philosophy. Philosophy originated in the ancient world among the Greeks. The same articulation but in his own idiom, Martin Heidegger, what is philosophy? So I've shown you uh, the problem um, through the so sources themselves and as remarked on by Du Bois. Okay, and this um, some years ago, uh, called for uh, investigating. At the time, I received no help from European scholarship on the history of philosophy. Gail Zetzer, uh, the scholar writing in French, Lucien Braun, the Italian team led by Giovanni Santinello, and the German scholar, Ulrich Johannes Schneider. These are works 
that are on the reflective level concerning the history of philosophy. Schneider's work takes lessons from Foucault in his approach, which he calls an archeology span of the history of philosophy. Not a recognition of Eurocentrism as actually a problem. Reflective work on the history of philosophy that shows that something like an archeology span of philosophy is required. And yet European scholarship lacks, lacks a view, probably because of its inside position. But I did receive help from the sociologists of knowledge, Du Bois, Emmanuel Wallerstein, Anibal Chiano, and the sociologist at Hamburg, Wolf D. Hunt. Keanu's work, whenever he begins an essay or a lecture, he begins with his critical theory of race. It is the frame by which he lets his readers understand Eurocentrism, and its connection to the history of colonialism. I quote him, from the 16th century on, this racial principle, the idea of race has proven to be the most effect effective and long lasting instrument of universal social domination. Since the much older principle, gender or intersexual domination was encroached on by inferior superior racial classifications. So the conquered and dominated peoples were situated in a natural position, natural in the sense of uh, material, materially subordinated, a natural position of inferiority. And as a result, their phenotypic traits, as well as their cultural features were likewise considered inferior. In this way, race became the fundamental criterion for the distribution of the, world, of the world population into ranks, places, roles in the new society structure of power. He adds, as a center of global capitalism, Europe not only had control of the world market, but was also able to impose its colonial dominance over all the regions and populations of the planet, incorporating them into its world system and a specific model of power. For such reasons and populations, this model of power involved a process of historical re-identification. Re From Europe, such regions and populations were attributed new geocultural identities. And uh, this is how uh, the decades of uh, sociological analysis in a Latin American context uh, uh, was handy for a study of the coloniality of knowledge uh, globally. And Professor Hunt, in the 16th century race, uh, this is his critical theory of race, 
is founded through the inclusion of the lower classes in colonial land seizure, genocidal settlement policies, and a plantation economy based on slavery. In the 17th century, science combines the views on human groups of different skin colors with notions of cultural and intellectual superiority, synchronized with climate theoretical reflections on the relationship between environment and culture, as well as historical philosophical ideas about the progress of humanity, and finally incorporated in the race theory formulated by Kant and others. So what I would like to do now is uh, show you some uh, sources, textual sources, to draw a picture of uh, the openness and inclusiveness of the of histories of philosophy and the conception of philosophy until in the long period, in the long duration leading up to the 1780s, then I would like to show you uh, developments in science, in European science, uh, right about uh, at that point of the last quarter of the 18th century, in order to show you how the history of philosophy, the writing of the history of philosophy changed. Diogenes Laertius's text, Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers. This is uh, a very frequently used source for the history of philosophy into the modern centuries. Uh, he is also the source of those historians of philosophy uh, who claim that uh, philosophy should be understood as a Greek conception, a Greek invention, okay. Okay. which then of course is to argue uh, that philosophy uh, did not quite exist apart from the Greeks, that is among the non-Greek peoples uh, before and also contemporaneous with the Greeks. He says that the barbarians had no word or concept of philosophy. I just want to point out that uh, uh, this is a not definitive for historians of philosophy from the Renaissance uh, to the early 19th century. Okay. We shall see that the question remains open uh, despite the opinion of this uh, frequently cited authority. There is a history of philosophy by Georg Horn from 1655. Uh, he claims that the first philosopher is Adam. And this is within a uh, uh, Old Testament model of human history. Thomas Stanley's work, A History of Philosophy, published in London around the same time with several successive editions. The first chapter of Stanley's history calls Thales the first or describes Thales as the first who introduced natural and mathematical learning into Greece. Uh, Thales is given a geography, Miletus, but this geography, as Stanley notes, uh, is on the edge of Asia. 
And Stanley comments that Thales had Asian parentage, Phoenician, and traveled through Western Asia, and that he brought philosophy from what he learned in Egypt and uh, was the one who bridged that, re uh, that knowledge of philosophy, as he says, into his own country. In terms of origin of philosophy, he writes that it has a Greek original, specifically Chaldean, uh, which is a name for Babylon and the Egyptians. He called the Chaldeans the most ancient of teachers. A history of philosophy by Vosius from 1657 surveys the philosophies of the ancient Asian peoples and Egypt and Egyptians and Ethiopians before turning to the philosophy of the Greeks. Thomas Burnett's history of philosophy begins with Noah and we're reminded of the uh, Old Testament model of history. Abraham de Grau, a history of philosophy published in the Netherlands, begins with Moses, but names Thales first knower. And Bedeus claims Adam as the first philosopher at the turn of the 18th century. The Italian Capasso, in his, for, in his history of philosophy in Latin, Adam is called the first sage. And that philosophy spread from the Hebrews to the other nations. Samuel Forney, Formey's history claims Adam as the first philosopher. Jakob Brucker, I will pause a while here, is the author of the most often referenced, uh, the most often uh, exerted and uh, reproduced history of philosophy published in the middle of the 18th century. And I have an image of the table of contents to show you that he, like all the rest, begins his history of philosophy. And he has a, a ethic or nations-based uh, organization uh, of the history of philosophy. Um, beginning with the philosophy among the Hebrews, Chaldeans, Persians, India, Arabia, Phoenicia. What I've also done is I have done some counting of the pages the number of pages dedicated to non-European philosophies. His chapter four, uh, his volume four is partly his supplementation of the earlier chap of the earlier volumes of his uh, Historia Critica. And in volume four, the page is dedicated to philosophy of the Asian peoples in general, 
there are 37 pages dedicated to uh, Asian philosophy in general. There are 28 pages dedicated to the philosophy of the Malabar people. So in Southwestern coastal India. There are 82 pages dedicated to the philosophy of the Chinese. 16 pages on the philosophy of the Japanese and 15 pages on the philosophy of the Canadians or Native Americans. As late as the end of the 18th century, the convention or tradition of writing of the history of philosophy began with philosophical traditions as Europeans understood them in Asia and Africa. Friedrich Schlegel was a German literary critic and Orientalist among other roles. Raymond Schwab in his book titled The Oriental Renaissance called him the founder of said Oriental Renaissance. He was the first historian of philosophy to treat Indian philosophical ideas together with European ones in one historical context. Drawing from his knowledge of Sanskrit language and Sanskrit sources, Schlegel is credited with propagating the study of Sanskrit in Germany through his book on the language and wisdom of the Indians from 1808. And I have a image of the title page. So uh, in this book, which was a sensation uh, in the years after it was published, uh, Schlegel states that the physical differences of the human tribes are so far as their present development, not of great historical importance. And this is already in reply to uh, writers uh, who uh, understand the physical differences of the human tribes as decisive. Uh, he also writes, I quote, a harmful prejudice in this regard has been and still is the merely assumed and arbitrarily accepted distinction between Oriental and Greek learning and minds as if this difference were completely grounded in truth. Schlegel also left us his lectures on the history of philosophy which were uh, written down uh, by, his, uh, by his students. He had a few students in Cologne uh, in the early 19th century. And in these lectures, which I also uh, study and write about in my book, he used the example of the Sanskrit text Bhagavad Gita as a preeminent philosophical document saying that it is more strictly philosophical in form than Lucretius's De Rerum Natura, making his point that from these investigations, he writes, from these investigations, it emerges sufficiently that the Indians had real philosophy in both form and method and that at this time we lack only sufficient documents to be able to incorporate it into the history of philosophy. So what I've done now is I've given you a view of the manner in which historians of philosophy treated Asia and Africa. Uh, in the period starting with the Renaissance and into the 19th century. 
I would like to uh, turn your attention to a development starting in 1735. What I have on the screen is an image of Carl von Linné's work, Systema Naturae. In my account, which is uh, similar to other historians, whereas in the first half of the 18th century, the preeminent science was mathematical physics, in the second half of the century, it was natural classification and natural history. In the last quarter of the century, the most exhilarating development within natural classification and natural history was the pseudoscientific study of human races. Raciology is a name that I give to this exhilarating new field. In my account, as well as others, a mass of racial concepts and racial theories were invented in this period. Their inventors were prominent enlightenment philosophers. And this phenomenon was revealing uh, the source of Foucault's archaeology of knowledge as it concerns the 18th century. Natural classification, natural history is Foucault's best example. Of the 18th century episteme he writes in his work titled The Order of Things, The Project of a General Science of Order, a Theory of Signs, Analyzing Representation, the Arrangement of Identities and Differences into Order Tables. These constitute an area of empiricity in the classical age, which is his name for the Enlightenment period, that had not existed until the end of the Renaissance and that was destined to disappear early in the 19th century. And what I will do in my uh, presentation is suggest that that last part needs a revision. That this episteme was destined to disappear early in the 19th century. I'm going to suggest that it did not. Foucault continues, it is patent that these three notions, this is part of his analysis of uh, the 18th century episteme. It is patent that these three notions, methesis, taxonomia, genesis, designate not so much separate domains as a solid grid of kinships that defines a general configuration of knowledge in the classical age. So, um, you know, whereas historians find uh, Foucault's grasp of 18th century uh, to be errant in many of his claims, I believe that this claim uh, stands up uh, and I do refer to it. Uh, in my understanding of 18th century science. He continues, the center of knowledge in the 17th and 18th centuries is the table. Uh, elsewhere he says um, uh, that, uh, elsewhere he says or uses the word grid. So let's, uh, let us apply uh, a Foucault's analysis 
to uh, the work of the natural historians, Linnaeus was a Swedish botanist and natural historian, professor in the medical faculty at Uppsala University. He was a founder of the binomial nomenclature that is still in use in taxonomy today. He is also noted as the first natural historian to include man, that special creation of gods in natural classifications. He is the author of the Systema Naturae. His work of natural classification in a succession of editions. By the end of his effort, he had classified around 4,400 species of animals and 7,700 species of plants. I've copied out the page classifying Homo sapiens from the 10th edition of Systema Naturae. And here you see the binomial naming Homo sapiens ordered under the animal kingdom and under the class mammalia and under that the order primates. Homo sapiens, the genus and species, uh, is further ordered into, uh, at this point, we shall say varieties. Homo sapiens ferus, or wild, four-footed, mute, hairy, Homo sapiens americanus, red, choleric, uh, erect, Homo sapiens europaeus, a sanguine temperament, Asiaticus, sallow, pale yellow, Loridus, temperamentally melancholic or humorally and rigid, Africanus, black, phlegmatic, lazy, you notice that the uh, description for Africanus uh, is longer. Uh, there are more in there's more interest in that variety on the part of Linnaeus. Uh, curly hair, wide nose, extended labia, and so on, no need for me to cover all the Latin. And, and there were these dubious uh, varieties that he also included because they came back in travel reports uh, by Europeans, monstrosis and troglodytes. Already in Linnaeus's classification, humans are uh, described according to complexion or skin color. The varieties are given geographical definitions. And in other editions, the moral qualities are included in the description of the four varieties if we exclude wild man and um, monstrous man.
Georges Louis Leclerc, the Comte de Buffon, was the director of the Royal Gardens in Paris. He was a leading author of the Histoire Naturelle, a work of natural history totaling 44 volumes. The final volumes were completed after his death. Buffon was a pre-formationist concerning the question of the origin of species. That is, he believed that all species were created at the biblical creation. And by the way, this is a position of Linnaeus. That species are fixed in number and kind, but that there can be variations within species. For the human species, he describes six varieties. Among his contributions is his scientific definition of species. He defines species as a constant succession of similar individuals that can reproduce together. By the way, this definition of species is no longer current. Buffon also contributed a climate theory of variations of species. And I will, uh, I will briefly uh, describe that climate theory. It goes like this. Members of a given species migrate away from their geographical origin. They come into different climates and geographies that cause variations within species. Included in climate and geography are conditions such as soil, water, air, food, sunlight, altitude, latitude on the globe. And so the natural classification of humans proceeds onward in theoretical and empirical elaborations. Immanuel Kant, uh, besides our knowing that he is a professor of philosophy. He was a professor of philosophy at Königsberg in East Prussia. We ought to know that he also gave a lecture course on physical geography every year or something like that of his teaching career from 1756 to his retirement in 1796. By, by 1772, he created a separate course on anthropology, which he also taught regularly until his retirement. He was a popular teacher for the reason of his physical geography and anthropology courses. And in these courses is where he taught his raciology. Stemming from these courses was his work on a scientific theory of race. Okay. In the 1770s and 1780s, Kant published three essays on the topic of human races. 1775, his essay on the different races of men. His 1785 essay, Determination of the Concept of Race. And the 1788 essay 
on the use of teleological principles in philosophy. In these essays, Kant affirms that there is one human species, but names and briefly describes four basic races, many more half races and one or two incipient races. He lays out the causes internal and external of racial characteristics and also established skin color as the prime characteristic. That is, however, following on Linnaeus's use of skin color in racial description. Kant builds on Buffon's external causes for variation within species, but also introduces his own internal causes. And he has a wild theory of internal causes, uh, uh, a theory of seeds or germs in combination with uh, the natural predisposition of uh, the human body. The third essay in this list is his defense of his scientific claims about races against criticism by the naturalist and explorer Georg Forster. So according to Kant's classification, there are four races, four genuine races, that of the white, or that of the whites, uh, the Negro race, the Hunnish race, and the Hindu or his Hindustani race. And he revises that uh, over these, over the course of these uh, uh, researches. Okay. In fact, I can't, usually I cannot uh, keep them clear in my mind. But the work of natural classification is division, sorting, and of course, description. So along with his Please let me know if um, uh, there's something going on that uh, there's something going wrong. I, uh, I'd like to correct it. That's um, what I will do is I will also turn on the chat view. Maybe that will help me. No worries. Someone logged in, so uh, you can continue. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm towards the end of my talk. So description of the races. Wow. Okay, I, as you see that actually, how we describe the human races were captured in the transcriptions by his students. Okay, and they're, uh, they can be found in his uh, uh, collected writings. And what I will do is I will just uh, reference uh, one of these instances, okay? So these are Reflexionen zur Anthropologie. Those are also um, Kant's lectures, cap, uh, uh, Kant's lectures from his own notes. Okay, and so what he has is first, you can imagine him giving his lecture in anthropology. Okay, and now he is going to uh, teach uh, the human uh, uh, racial classification. So he begins with the argument for monogenesis. Then he enumerates four races and describing the characteristics of each. And in these notes, he has 
the Americans, the race of the Negroes, the race of the Indians, and the race of the whites. And part of this description is to, uh, is to set out these definitions or, or the race of the Americans and the race of the blacks uh, are uh, not capable of self-government. Okay, they're amenable to a uh, state of slavery. Okay, and then further down, it is only the race of the whites who have brought forth all the revolutions in the world. The other three races, not at all. And then the, the last quote, the last quoted material, uh, quoted matter, our ancient history of humans goes far as far back as the race of the whites uh, and that is inclusive of, inclusive of Egyptians, Persians, Thracians, Greeks, Celts, and Scythians. And he, and he adds explicitly, he, he must be stating explicitly in lecture, uh, not yellow Indians, right? And not black Africans. Okay, these are his anthropology, lectures again captured in students' trans transcriptions. So students heard him say, all Oriental peoples are not in a position to establish through concepts a single property of morality or law. Rather, all their morals are based on appearances. So they have no uh, conceptual or theoretical approach to, uh, to law or, uh, or moral theory, um, moral teachings. And over here, this is again, more transcription by his students of what he said in lecture. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's more worthwhile to show you Blumenbach. So uh, he was a medical professor at the University of Göttingen. This is his uh, racial classification. Okay. He is the one who gave us these names, specifically the Caucasian name for the white race. Okay, and this is another 18th century philosopher. This is his racial classification. It's becoming nauseating. He has two branches, right? Tartar or Caucasian and Mongolic on the other hand. Okay, and he revises his racial classification. Okay, and his racial descriptions. All right, so. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. So what I will do is go over here. So the exclusion of Africa and Asia from the history of philosophy uh, 
began in the 1780s. Um, I have researched and found these three historians of philosophy who excluded African and Asian philosophies and they all come at the end of the 18th century. Okay, and so uh, if there is a change, uh, it is quite recent. Okay, and this, this changes, you could see it in its, uh, you could see it in its, uh, in its germ, its starting point. And what I have here is uh, the Kantian historian of philosophy, Tenemann. This exclusion is literal. And why I have the table of contents on the right side uh, to show you is uh, that Oriental, over here you see it uh, one quarter of the way down, the philosophy of the Orientals, right, or Asian philosophy, African philosophy, right, is discussed in a uh, shortened manner before in the introduct in introductory comments before he uh, before he recounts the history of philosophy uh, in earnest. Okay, so that non-European philosophies are literally um, on the page, excluded from the history of philosophy. Okay. Okay, and I have slides here to show you that, uh, that this exclusion is uh, consonant with what Kant lectured uh, during those times that he uh, remarked on the origins of philosophy. So the, the Kantian historians are uh, in agreement with Kant. Okay, so obviously uh, we can consider them a school of historiographical thought. I think that's good to stop right there and to uh, bring others in. Okay, I will stop sharing just to give everyone a break from the nausea. Thank you, Peter. Um, that was... Um... A really fascinating um, um, history uh, of how uh, the, the colonization of philosophy took root, uh, particularly during during Enlightenment. And um, uh, there's, there's there's a lot, um, and I'm, I'm happy that um, the lecture has been recorded. There, there are a lot of sources you've used, a lot of uh, quotations that many of us would like to uh, go back into and, and, and really look at. Uh, and it's very interesting that prior to the Enlightenment, there, there were a lot of um, uh, historical accounts of philosophy that took into consideration um, the different philosophical traditions. And somehow uh, that gradually just started fading away. Um, so um, we'll, we'll now, open the floor for comments and questions. And I think there's, there's uh, one already from um, uh, Raj, which says um, uh, basically that um, uh, my own view is that philosophy involves the positive of truth about the nature and meaning of life, morality, and death. To deny that non-white people practice philosophy is to suggest that they don't care about truth. Um, um, and says, can I ask why you think that the word philosophy, the word philosophy, that's the word itself, matters? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. 
Yes, so the uh, uh, the racial taxonomy of humans is a knowledge, a knowledge that speaks to the question from Raj. And the racial taxonomy as a knowledge answers the question, Raj's question. Non-white nations do not, mm, it's gonna be uh, hierarchical, um, the taxonomy will be gradiated. Non-white peoples care less about truth. And as you move down the racial scale, non-European peoples care even less depending on where they are in the racial hierarchy. That is the knowledge of the 18th century. So, so basically the, the racial hierarchy were create, were create, uh, was created to um, sell this false idea basically uh, and, and put Western philosophy at the very top of the hierarchy. Yes, yes, and uh, there is um, uh, no intuition of the uh, racial taxonomy as being false. There is no intuition of that. Um, this activity of uh, racial taxonomy just continues. It's like a runaway freight train and others add to it and it is elaborated and it is contiguous with 19th century raciology without any breaks. Uh, and I'm thinking that um, racial taxonomy finally loosens its grip only after the end of World War II and decolonization. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Um, we have um, uh, a question from uh, Bia. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we okay. can hear. Yes. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk. I was uh, interested in commenting on, on what you just said, that there was no intuition um, about, yeah, about the problem that came up with this idea of racial taxonomy and the implicit racial hierarchy. And I was wondering um, how you mean that, because usually I feel that there is, to a certain degree, a knowledge that the that the positing of oneself at the top um, of the of, of whatever that might be of a racial hierarchy that that there was a certain knowledge that that is not the right thing to do and that there was great work spent on the fact to justify um, to be to justify the idea of oneself being the ideal human and i think just to name one example one can see it that there was that there was a very selective process with regards to other cultures so for example the westernization or the attempt of westernization of egyptian culture so there was a good understanding that that seems to be an interesting part of the african culture but it got de-Africanized and to a certain degree Westernized and it got, um, and, and there seems to have been a process of appropriating that culture, which to my, to my understanding, to a certain degree shows that it was very, very arbitrary that my people and, and me, not only as a white scholar, but as a white scholar born in Germany, it is really my people who invented a good portion of these ideas, that they had a very good understanding, especially Kant had a fairly good understanding that this is arbitrary and that it is that it leads us to this strange observation that um, racism is older than the idea of race and that um, the, the, the raciological ideology was developed 
to defend a claim of whom the esteemed philosophers of the past knew that it was actually invalid. So that, I would be very interested in your comments on that. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, I was, uh, in order to um, adequately uh, address your question, I was in my mind focused, uh, focusing um, specifically on um, the European scholarship on Egypt, Egyptian history. And so I was uh, th thinking this possibility, uh, could European scholars of Egypt have been deliberately or knowingly whitening them, making them into whites? Like, um, as in thinking in terms of uh, power and uh, self-interest um, in an uh, indirect way, in a uh, self-interest in a intellectual sense, could they be knowingly whitening Egypt, Egyptians, uh, raciologically or whitening Egyptian civilization, so the Egyptian knowledge. Um, I think that through that process, they uh, understood that they were uh, performing uh, scientific researches and that um, if they understood the Egyptians to be racially white, then that came about through scientific discovery. Um, is there a case of a European scholar who uh, knowingly, as in like, um, with a sensation of, with the knowledge of the falsehood of, of the claim, would there be any example of a scholar who in that sense knowingly whitened the Egyptians I think they had, and that we could find that uh, they only had scientific reasons for whitening the Egyptians. Uh, that's my uh, that's my current observation, Bjorn. Thank you, Peter. Um, we have a question from Andrea on the chat. It says, um, I'm unclear whether you want to say that all history of philosophy is necessarily racist and exclusionary. If not, uh, what would a non-racist, non-exclusionary history of philosophy look like? Excellent. Um, I am willing to uh, pursue uh, a claim that all histories of philosophy are racist and exclusionary. Uh, I am willing to pursue that claim. Um, and my reasons for that are that um, the raciology uh, provides uh, the a priori principles for how to write the thing. Okay. So the history of philosophy is organized by um, um, an origin point. So there has to be an account of the origin point. Okay, there has to be 
an account of uh, philosophy's progressive development. Okay, and then there has to be an account of uh, the philosophers who are developing philosophy, this knowledge, right? The, the knowers who are developing the knowledge. And uh, all those particulars, all those choices in the writing of history of philosophy, they have to be determined, they have to be chosen, but the choice is determined, as it were, by the a priori principles of writing in this genre. Um, we have a coherent account of the history of philosophy as a progress of philosophy by understanding that the subjects are all white racially and what that means. I'm gonna stop right there because uh, that requires more uh, discussion and feedback, but I will stop right there. Uh, as to your second question, what would a non-racist, non-exclusionary history of philosophy look like? You know, that ought to be actually the question for the entire discussion so that we do uh, uh, practical work. Uh, uh, what I would like to do is uh, I'm going to anticipate that the question will come up again and that some large portion of the discussion should be dedicated to that question, Andrea. So I'm going to hold off and see if uh, uh, others will pile on in terms of what the discussion should do. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be reminding you of that. Um, perhaps that would be a, a final point of discussion before we uh, round up. Um, there's there's a, a question from uh, Andrew Hines. Yes, thanks so much, Professor Park. Um, I, I'm, intellectual history is a huge passion of mine, so it was a huge pleasure um, always to think about philosophical insights from it. So thank you. This might um, deepen Andrea's question, I'm not sure, but I, I think I'm wondering about the disentanglement of things. So what I mean by that is you give a great example of Kant's hierarchy of race, his theory of race. Um, and then I, I think that the example I was thinking of was um, one of the things I always bump up against, I suppose, is reflecting on, I don't really have an answer, but it's reflecting on um, the fact that these ideas are also very entangled within things that are, to use your word, handy um, in the contemporary world. Um, so, for example, um, Immanuel Kant's theory of the human being and cosmopolitanism is written into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, another great example would be how his work on symbolism and, and figurative thought has been extremely influential in the contemporary development of neuroscience. So there's all these entanglements in our globalized world with um, a thinker. And I'm not saying that vindicates them, but it makes me pause and go, it's, it's all very messy. At which point does one end and another begin? Um, and so I just, I just wondered if you had any reflections on that. Uh, my very confused question. Thank you. No, I understand the question completely, Andrew. Uh, for, for this, I, my mind refers to the work of uh, Lucy Alaise. So she too can deliver such a lecture as you heard today okay, because she knows well uh, Kant's role in uh, modern scientific racism, okay? And also uh, the, uh, consequences of that within her discipline of philosophy. So uh, she writes on Kant's racism, right? And she is a Kant scholar, uh, but she also, uh, uh, she also teaches 
that uh, we ought to uh, continue using Kant. Okay, continue using Kant uh, to do uh, decolonial work, justice work, social justice work, uh, and uh, also on the level of uh, his theoretical insights, uh, use them too in the theoretical work by philosophers. Okay, and I will, because I'm referring what she's already thought deeply on, I will stop right there. But um, baby with the bathwater, uh, not necessarily. Uh, so that's a initial answer for you, Andrew. Um, thank you, Pat. Um, we have um, Robert. Hello, Peter. Good to see you. Um, just two quick things. One is to follow up on Bian's question. Um, and maybe I misunderstood your answer, but um, I think we can give more details about the whitening of the Egyptians. And without going back to Bernal, who we now know needs to be corrected. But the you already, I mean, if you look at Volney's ruins, which is what, 1796 or 1794, um, he's very clear, Volney, that the Egyptians are African. He changes that, it's true, in 1817, I think. It's very hard. There's not been a good study of all the different editions of uh, Volney, to my, best of my knowledge. But I think it's that's the earliest I've been able to find it, and he's still alive then. So it would seem to be an authorized edition, um, although it gets changed in some of the English translations later and then changed back. But the real, I think, point about well, what, what is the motivation behind this whitening? I think you have to look at Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of history, where he defines the Egyptians in terms of this clash between the Africans and uh, the Caucasians, who he say, you know, the philosophy of history begins with the Caucasians. Um, when he goes to Persia, and, and Egypt comes after that. So there's already something going on uh, with Hegel, although if you, the new edition, which uh, of the 1831 lectures, which just came out, I think it was earlier this year or late last year, um, you know, Carl Hegel's own manuscript, there seem to be fewer references to Africa in that. Uh, so it may be Carl Hegel is partly responsible here, although there are still references. So that, that's, that's something I'm sure you'll want to go away and research yourself. But on, on the issue of what's at stake, you just have to look at Josiah Knott writing in the United States, roughly, I think it's somewhere like 1844, I, I don't remember the exact date. And he says quite explicitly, if, the Egyptians were black, then everything that we stand for in the South uh, is uh, ruined. He's very clear that the whole Southern way of life, the idea of slavery is at stake with the Egyptians. And so that's what the whitening of the Egyptians mean. And that's why there is this uh, synchrony between Josiah Knott and George uh, Morton with the study of the skulls. Um, and that, there's a whole long story. I don't want to waste everybody's time on it, but, but so yes, that, there's something very much at stake there. But I want to, uh, as a second uh, quick question is, I mean, I think what's so uh, impressive about your book um, is the way you uh, go back and show that it was the challenge to Kant, which led the Kantians to have to narrow the history of philosophy. 
they had they uh, for those of you who haven't read Peter's book, and if you haven't, I'm not sure how you've missed it. But for those of you who haven't read Peter's book yet, um, I mean, if I remember correctly, it's a long time since I've read it. Um, Peter is arguing that well, people were complaining against Kant that um, he was just putting together other people's ideas, that he wasn't uh, fundamentally an original thinker. And so then the Kantians come along and rewrite the history of philosophy so that it culminates in Kant. And so it's, to that extent, what you that part of your book shows is um, in effect, uh, how Kant with this narrowing philosophy so that philosophy is fundamentally Kantian philosophy, which is a problem that those of us who still try to call ourselves philosophers have today. People are always still telling me I'm not a philosopher uh, because I'm not a Kantian. In effect, I think there are other problems that philosophy has to deal with. It's not just non-Western philosophy, not just African Asia that is being excluded. It's also a lot of, you know, um, what Bruker would still have thought of as, as a philosophy uh, in Europe that is being excluded. Now, as you rightly show in your book, um, this gets integrated with the racism, which is important um, for you know, colonial projects, so that the British want to buy into this and so on and so forth. And the certain myths that arise from a kind of um, inferiority complex of, of Europe. But I just want to, you didn't mention this aspect of your book. And I'm just wondering whether, is that because you're moving away from that thesis? Or did you just think there wasn't time for you to develop that today? Thank you, Robert. I, you, I follow Robert's uh, history of philosophy research closely. Um, uh, your uh, commentaries are beautiful um, in how you capture uh, so much of a book that I wrote a while ago. Um, and also uh, must ref uh, refresh my mind by, by looking at, as to your question, I think that the, uh, the role of Kant and the Kantians in the narrowing of the concept of philosophy through the revision of the history of philosophy, um, I still uh, hold that view. So I would still uh, argue that point. I think what I'm doing is I am extending my inquiry to uh, how much, uh, to what extent the revision of the history of philosophy is due to uh, it is an insight that I'm trying to um, make use of how much, to what extent the revision of the history of philosophy is due to um, the ruling episteme. Okay, so um, I want to see if uh, there is much more use uh, to be made of Foucault's uh, tools for uh, understanding 18th century knowledge. So uh, what I think is that my focus could from henceforth, my focus could widen from uh, the Kantian role, the role of the Kantians to uh, something like a general view, a, a view, a, a, uh, a general view of uh, the history of knowledge in this period. It's, I would like to uh, try to do an archaeology of knowledge, either with Foucault's tools or without, 
Okay, and I think that uh, there could be an account that explains the end result by referring to what is going on at the epistemic or archeological level, okay? And um, that's the new work I would like to do. I mean, we could, you know, I'd be humming and hawing a lot because it's still uh, not articulate enough, but um, the part where uh, historical actors do this and write this and uh, coordinate with other historical actors to uh, create results that are such, um, that's how I, uh, that's my way of doing intellectual history. So I have not moved away from that. I'm just curious about uh, if you have just a mass, a mass of, and a, a piling of racial taxonomy uh, within European knowledge, what is going to do, what is going to happen to historiography? Okay. Uh, historiography, there has to be an account of modern historiography that connects it to uh, this knowledge production. And it is, it is massive. I mean, it's already, uh, we have plenty, like numerous enlightenment philosophers involved in racial taxonomy at the end of the 19th century. I have yet to uh, gather a view of the early 19th century to connect it to Josiah Knott and Morton, but this thing only increases. And how will that change the writing of the history of philosophy and also the uh, historic historiography of non-European peoples? Uh, it could be overwhelming. And that's, uh, uh, that's where I'm going. And that's the reason for uh, a new trend in my research. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, Professor Robert, um, for your question as well. Uh, so we have th three hands uh, up. We'll take them before taking the questions. Uh, we have about two or so questions in the chat as well. And um, I'm sure we can meet up with these five uh, before we round up. So let, let's um, go ahead with uh, David. Uh, I, I didn't know whether you uh, called upon me. I, I just so admire Peter's work. Uh, and one question is this for a reflection. Why is it that Europeans and Americans wanted to focus increasingly in the 19th century on Greeks as their predecessors? And there's a text which uh, Peter might add to his collection is to look at uh, Plutarch's Life of Alexander, where colonialism and racialism feed each other so as to justify imperial conquest. In early United States history, the, the great founding fathers that we talk about all turned to Rome and Greek inheritance. And one reason for this was it could justify the conquest and genocide of Native Americans uh, because uh, they were foreign to the Greek culture. Going back to Alexander, when Alexander starts going east, uh, his uh, troops were getting enormous booty and wealth from the conquests. But according to Plutarch, he would say, I'm doing this because I'm bringing civilization to Persia, to India. It made no sense, but it was an excuse as it were 
to use racism as a justification for exploitation, colonialism, and imperialism. Now, this is just one tiny thread in this complicated story you're, you're uh, working on, Peter, but I wanted to add that uh, to the mix. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. I would love for my uh, research to uh, extend into uh, further into the colonial context of the revision of modern history. Um, I th think there is a direct connection. Okay, and uh, I'm new at this. We have other colleagues uh, who uh, are skillful in connecting changes in no the, our knowledge systems with the uh, modern colonial enterprise. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, David. Um, Yoko? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your very important work. Um, I just wanted to comment on this idea whether history of philosophy itself is um, fundamentally racist or whether other conceptions could um, be available. And um, I just wanted to introduce a project. Uh, we are a team from the University of Hildesheim in Germany. And for two years, we have been involved in um, a project of uh, reconceptualizing the historiography of philosophy from a global perspective. And what we do is gather histories, historiographies of philosophy in different languages. And um, our, um, what we found out is that um, in Chinese, in Russian, in not Tur uh, Turkish, in Iranian, the Persian, as in different languages, the histories of philosophies are written completely differently. Who is included? what kind of um, issues are being discussed. So the history of philosophy, I mean, we focus on these European heritage because we are living in this legacy, of course. So that's our history of philosophy that has its own um, racist past. But um, if you look at the history of philosophy as a way of creating his historiographies of thought, um, from different perspectives of the world and different languages using different concepts and different ways of conceptualizing history, then it looks very different. And um, also um, a historiography of the, the colonial um, uh, past spoken and written from um, the colonized, yeah, uh, such, uh, histories of philosophies are produced um, in Spanish, for instance. They were forced to use their colonized language, yeah? So um, it seems to me since now, um, yeah, the intellectual scene is becoming more and more global, if you will, right? So these different alternative histories of philosophies are um, available. It's just that we just don't have access to them. We just, we find people who are, who can do research in original languages about, we have, um, oh, thanks Bjorn. Yeah, uh, Bjorn was uh, with us uh, like uh, a few months ago um, in our project. And so we invite people who are, are sort of like-minded and then um, it's a new project, but um, we are beginning to um, connect with people. So I'm sure we would like to invite you sometime too. <laughs> but anyway, I just wondered if you are optimistic in this sense, yeah, to, to, to look at histories of philosophy, not from English, German, French, no, but from yeah, some other ways of looking at the world. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ikane. <clears throat> uh, I'm so sorry, thank you, uh, uh, Yoko. Um, I am not surprised that uh, 
history of philosophy is written in entirely different ways uh, by historians of philosophy in other languages. Uh, it is a problem that because of uh, Euro supremacy, uh, we are uh, still referring to uh, histories of philosophy written in French, German, English. Uh, that is the problem. And what, you're, what, what the team in Hildesheim is doing is uh, directly uh, uh, addressing uh, the, the sources, the causes of, uh, of uh, exclusion and uh, narrowing. I think that uh, whether one, the level of one's optimism depends on uh, where one is, okay, and what, it, <laughs> what uh, philosophy, uh, the philosophy discipline, how it is in the places where we work. And in the US, uh, there is reason to be less optimistic. I am supposing that the view from Hildesheim is more optimistic. So then um, what I'm saying is that, oh, my thought refer, my references are institutions of philosophy and university and higher education, okay? Um, at some point, someone will, and maybe the team in Hildesheim, will uh, conceive a problem of addressing the problem, uh, addressing the problem of the racism and colonialism of philosophy, of the philosophy discipline by looking at the institutions of philosophy and conceive a project that actually addresses institutions and how to change them. Uh, I think there probably is a project out there like that. There has to be, because I cannot be the only one who understands that the level of optimism is dependent on whether our institutions can be changed. Thank you. Thank you, Yoko. Thank you, Peter. Um, Wanna call on uh, Louis? Uh, yes, thank you very uh, much, uh, Professor Park, for this very inspiring uh, lecture. My question adds uh, very well to that of um, Dr. Yoko. Um, actually, what I would like to add is um, from, well, I'm myself, I'm an Ashanti expert, and um, my well, findings on African people and their philosophies in oral tradition, that um, it seems to me that actually this like um, positioning people in hierarchies is something that is, yeah, also like a human characteristic. So if you start to focus on other um, well, philosophies and oral traditions, you will find in a way the same thing that, for instance, the, if you look at the Ashanti on how they uh, discuss the the, the people of the, the northern hinterland, like the Mamprusi and the Dankumba people, then it's clear that they find themselves that they are on top of the world and on in the middle of the, the map. And they also have, they created this, uh, they have their own way of, uh, well, cartographic uh, tradition. And then they are clearly at the center and um, yeah, these other, they're also, you know, 
um, focus on themselves as the ones who are on top of hierarchy. So I think it's um, uh, this is not to um, um, take away this entire argument that there's been colonialism and Eurocentrism and that people have been uh, oppressed and therefore their traditions are uh, um, are well not in an um, equal way discussed in European philosophical works but um, well on the other hand I think if you focus start to focus and start to include that as they are now doing in Hildesheim these other traditions then you will find that on the other side of the world it's not that people uh, will dare uh, focus equally on all the traditions in their own countries. Another um, example to finish uh, with is, for instance, the Bamoon people in Cameroon. Um, they, there was a, a, a famous uh, king there. He's called, he was called Nyoya, and then he created his own an entire um, um, cryptic. Um, yeah, oral traditional language. And he also was very advanced in map making. And the reason he did the, all this is to conquer and um, subjugate all the people around him. So it was also, you know, he knew that knowledge was power. And uh, the way he, uh, the reason he did all this is to be on top of this taxonomic hierarchy. So, well, that was my addition to your um, excellent lecture. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Louise. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, um, you know, I absorb the, I absorb the uh, commentary. Uh, it's actually information that um, uh, will go to use for my reflection. Um, somehow I'm reminded of uh, what uh, the historians of race and racism, uh, how they handle uh, the fact that uh, in every era of human history, we have um, uh, self-referential systems of knowledge, uh, that it is combined with power, okay? Um, and how the historians of race and racism uh, handle this fact is to uh, be very, uh, be very diligent about uh, differentiating or making a particular uh, the modern, combination of uh, racism and power uh, with the modern colonial project. So uh, therefore setting uh, the parameters uh, of the discussion. A, a result of that is finding out that actually a lot of modern racial ideas have ancient, for example, ancient Greek and Roman origin, right? For example, the climate theory and also uh, the part, uh, the idea of uh, temperament, um, uh, the four humors theory, right? Uh, of ancient Greek medical knowledge. Okay, so what they've done is our historians of race and racism have uh, carefully shown that uh, ideas that are used by uh, modern racial theorists from, are from uh, surprising places uh, in uh, within human history and also human geography but uh, there is something that can be uh, referred to as distinct and, uh, and its own 
object of study, and that would be uh, the combination of modern colonialism with the racism, right? And so um, uh, one conclusion from this research is that actually uh, Isaac, Isaacson, Benjamin Isaacson argues that the ancient Greeks and Romans, Romans did not quite have uh, uh, the racism, these uh, racist ideas that we have in the modern period, right? So that's one, uh, that's one outcome of the research, right? Even though uh, they are uh, among the sources drawn from by the modern racial theorists. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, that's what I think um, um, the, the, the question on the chat um, goes back to what Andrea asked earlier about um, um, how can we then um, work towards producing a non-exclusionary and non-racist history of philosophy. Uh, Peter Ikhani uh, raises that question again. Sigal raises something similar to that again. So I, I believe perhaps those will be your uh, last uh, thoughts before we call it a day. Uh, but I think prior to that, uh, Beyond has a quick question. Bjorn, please uh, turn on your mic for me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I was just uh, have a very quick question uh, that's regarding to what you just said when you said that the, the that there's the strange uh, effect that um, in Roman and Greek era we do not have this kind of racism that we observe today or that has been to a certain degree invented in the 18th century. <clears throat> but I still think it's very important to draw an immediate line between the Greek and Roman tradition and what has happened in the 18th century. I would argue that the understanding of um, the the um, yeah the, the white person or the European or the Euro and Western individual as the superhuman being entitled to dominate other humans has had different forms and that fo it has existed in Roman times in one way and it and it has existed in the 18th 19th century in another way but what I think is important to point out that even if racism in, op in opposition to what is often claimed that it was always there has not existed in the form we know it today. I think before it has invented primarily by German authors, th the understanding of oneself as the superior one and the other as the inferior other who will only um, be able to, to uh, gain importance and value if he replicates the definitive one. That is a structure that is indeed a very old structure. We probably cannot address it as racism in the modern sense, but we can certainly find this kind of superiorism even in the Greek and Roman structures. And at this, and I think this is one of the reasons this elitist, especially in the classical Greek philosophy and Plato, and most importantly in Aristotle's politics, we can find a clear definition of a superior being by virtue of his superiorness, and I intentionally can say his in this case, being allowed to dominate other people. So I think even if we can make this conceptual difference, which, which I, I agree is very important, we, we have to take into account that, the, that in the West, probably in other uh, cultural um, and ultra -cult cultural histories as well, but we in the end committed the genocides and the murders and the most of the enslavement, that, that we have a long history of producing explanations why we, addressing me and my people, um, thought we uh, deserve to be on the top. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. I have prepared a slide for this question from, uh, from two of our uh, audience members uh, about non-racist uh, histories of philosophy, uh, about uh, decolonizing 
uh, our philosophy uh, curriculum or uh, philosophy, the discipline, uh, all around discipline of philosophy. I've prepared a slide um, because it's, uh, one can well anticipate the question. So I'm gonna share the slide, okay. And hope that you are, uh, will be glad to see it. Okay. So um, I say that we already have the tools, the decolonial approaches and techniques uh, for uh, a response to uh, the uh, racist and colonial uh, origins and effects of uh, our discipline of philosophy. We already have the tools, okay? And these tools are, as I've listed them here, just collected from what philosophers, uh, anti-racist philosophers and decolonial philosophers and philosophers of race are already doing. So what I've done is I've just uh, collected these tools okay, from colleagues who are already doing the work of a non-racist uh, philosophy discipline. And we're thinking uh, often in terms of the teaching of philosophy in the classroom. They are the tools of counter narrative, counter arguments, alternative perspectives. I think we are seeing more uh, African perspectives than uh, earlier uh, in the history of the philosophy di discipline, for example. Historicizing philosophy, which is what Robert Bernasconi and I and others do. We might draw from Foucault and do genealogy or archeology span of knowledge, or as I've shown in a slide at the beginning of my talk, make use of the tools of sociology of knowledge. Also transdisciplinarity, the work of Africana and Caribbean philosophers, creolizing ontologies, the work of our feminist philosophers, phenomenology of knowledge. What we all can do simply by changing our syllabi is transgressing the canons of philosophy and shifting the geography of philosophy, which is something I've come to think about uh, often and over and over again from my involvement with Caribbean philosophers and Africana philosophers. Uh, this just means to do philosophy from a different place besides Europe and the concerns and the environments and the needs of philosophy at a different place than Europe. I think these are probably approaches and techniques. A lot of them are already familiar to uh, us. So um, the work is already underway, okay? Uh, in terms of my optimism, it does not help my optimism that um, I am a researcher in the history of philosophy and also the historiography of philosophy, right? So that, um, that keeps me uh, looking backward instead of forward, but that's just from my research. Uh, I rather read uh, anti-colonial, anti-racist, and decolonial philosophers uh, when I'm not doing my research.
Yeah, it's, it's been a, a fascinating lecture and good discussion afterward. Uh, it, I, I mean, it's, it's difficult to, um, to touch on, you know, the, in a very detailed way, uh, the history of philosophy within two hours. Um, as a lecture and as a discussion, but the discussions that ensue shows shows how uh, deeply interesting uh, your talk has been, and how important your book has been uh, for many of us. And we we look forward to um, your research developments as you explore this this archaeology um, of knowledge and the uh, that, that you are now. Uh, exploring with regards to um, the raciology in philosophy. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Professor Peter Park, for uh, giving us the privilege to listen to you this evening and for well, money over, your, <laughs> over where you are um, and for really enlightening us. Uh, I believe, like me, many of us will be uh, watching this again and taking it. Um, little by little, piece by piece, and, uh, you know, dissecting those materials you draw attention to uh, this, this evening. And thank you all for always being part of the lecture series. Uh, the next one is on October 29th, and uh, we'll send out the invite as usual. And that also promises to be a very interesting discussion as well. Uh, so we'll draw the curtain here. Uh, I'll stop recording now.